<laughs> Excellent. We are live. So hi, guys, and um, welcome to this evening with Louisa Wood. And over to you, Lou. You can do a little bit of a, a talk about where you've been and what you've been doing and that sort of thing. Yeah, cool. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Kirsten for having me. This is a really awesome opportunity um, and one that, yeah, I was really excited about when she um, asked me to be on here and I'm excited to talk to everyone and answer your questions. Um, yeah, I just thought that this was really appropriate considering all the sort of training that Kirsten's been doing with you guys and your, <clears throat> excuse me, online videos and things. Obviously, nutrition just goes hand in hand with um, performance and with training and riding and all that sort of thing. So really, really important to keep that in mind as well. Um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of background about myself um, just quickly before we launch into these questions. So I um, currently work for two feed companies in New Zealand called NRM and Macmillan Equine. Um, I'm not going to make this tonight sort of too product specific and more, um, I think it's more going to be about, I want to make it more about education and answering your questions, but if there's appropriate products um, that are relevant to your questions, I'll pop them in there um, and give you a little bit of information about them. So I've been with NRM and Macmillan for five years. Before that, um, I did uh, an applied science uh, degree from Massey University. Um, and then I went to work for Kentucky Equine Research in Kentucky. I did an internship with them for a year. This is a number of years ago now. Um, and then I worked for them at their Melbourne office as a nutrition advisor. So I've got um, considerable experience with consulting on farm, various different horses in Australia and here. Um, and then last year, while I was working for you NRM know, and Macmillan, I did a master's degree. Um, so I did a thesis on tying up or recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis in racehorses and did a massive data study on collecting um, data on what racehorse trainers feed and sort of analysing that. So we actually developed a feed on the back of that as well. It's a Kentucky Equine Research formulation called Muscle Relief, um, which I can talk about if anyone's got questions as well. So, um, yeah, without further ado, as I said, I'm not going to make this too sort of sales orientated, but yeah, any questions, um, happy to sort of answer them. I mean, as I said, I think nutrition obviously goes hand in hand with performance. You know yourself, um, if you go to the gym or go for a run or something and you haven't eaten well, or you haven't had a good breakfast, you probably won't feel that great or you won't perform as you should. Um, so just like us, we need to fuel our horses properly, give them the right energy sources, as well as making sure that they're getting the right nutrients and meeting all their requirements for your trace minerals and your vitamins to replenish their bodies and, yeah, make sure that they've got, got the right nutrients on board to recover and to perform again. So um, there's lots of different aspects of nutrition, obviously, um, and we all know what it's like when you walk into a feed store and how overwhelming it can be with the huge amount of feeds and supplements. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of here to help with that sort of thing as well. Um, Shall I rip into yeah. some questions? Because we've yeah, got a whole please. lot here lined up. So Fleur <laughs> asks, she's, she's got a two-year-old um, that she's feeding for optimum growth and has absolutely yep. no grass. Um, she wants to know what sort of roughages are best for winter, um, such as, you know, your hay or your fibre easy, your equa fibre, your better beat, all those sorts of things. Um, she's open to suggestions for just really some weight gain for young horses. Yep, cool. Okay, so um, obviously we've got a few different components to that question, but um, first of all, um, Obviously, if you don't have a lot of grass, horses need at least 1.5% of their body weight in forage every day. So did she say what breed it was, Kirst? Uh, just, um, just warm blood. Oh, cool. So he or she is probably going to need at least sort of seven and a half, eight kilos of forage a day. Um, and if there's no pasture, that's going to have to be replaced with, with hay. So hay is probably your best alternative um, forage for, for grass. Then obviously you've got lots of different fibres that you could um, use as well. So chaffs in with your feeds are great um, to bulk up your feeds a little bit. I'm also a really big fan of sort of beet pulp and soy hulls. So those are called super fibres because they're really, really digestible and provide quite a lot of energy, but just through that nice low starch, slow release form. Um, and yeah, I mean, your ensiled forages are great as well. Um, I personally prefer chaff because they're higher in dry matter, so you're sort of getting a bit more bang for your buck. 
Um, but it's a personal preference, really. If you like the sort of inside forages, like your yeah, fiber easies and things, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, any forage is great. There's different uh, benefits to different types. I really like lucerne. It's higher in calcium and protein, which is quite handy for a horse that's growing like yours. So a bit of lucerne in there, whether it's a slice or two of lucerne hay would be great, along with a grass hay um, or a bit of lucerne chaff would be really good. Um, so that's your forage covered, at least sort of eight kilos or basically as much hay as the horse can eat if you want um, weight gain. Um, and then for feeds, I mean, really, I think for a two-year-old, they're obviously not in work yet. They're just sort of hanging out in the paddock, growing and developing, probably going with a nice um, low starch, high fat and fibre feed. So something like a grain fruit, Macmillan's grain fruit is fabulous. Um, something that, yeah, doesn't have a lot of grain in it because the horse isn't doing a lot of work. Um, so using fat and fibre to put weight on him and to help him to sort of develop and grow would be ideal. So something like, I mean, a feed that has your beet pops, soy hulls, fat sources, Equijoule, um, Kentucky Equine Research Equijoule is a fantastic stabilised rice bran fat source. Um, there's also another Macmillan feed called Muscle Relief. But yeah, look for those feeds that are low in starch, so low in grains, but high in fat and fibre because he's just a baby and he's developing and yeah, not coming into work just yet. You could potentially think about grains when you're doing a bit of work with him, but for now, I think, yeah, just fat and fibre. Hope oh, that helps. Excellent. Um, so I haven't heard of the soy soy husks before. Is that a relatively new thing? Soy hulls, no, they've been around for a while. So they're sort of yeah. in the same category as beet pulp. Um, yeah. So they're, they're known as a super fibre. So maxi soy is soy hulls. Um, oh, yeah. And also yeah. um, grain free, which I just mentioned before, is soy hulls and beet pulp combined. So they're both known as, as super fibres. So uh, as I said, you soak, you soak them for 10 minutes and with grain free, it's twice its amount of water. Most of them are about the same. Um, and they supply a lot of calories, roughly the same amount of calories as oats, but in a nice slow release form. So it's basically not going to hype them up and not going to make them silly and not cause those peaks of blood glucose that can have that sort of effect. Um, so for a young horse, I sort of, I mean, some grain is fine, but I do like to keep it lower on the grain side for young growing horses um, to just avoid any behavioural problems. And sometimes grain can contribute to, to growth and developmental orthopaedic problems as well so oh, as a two-year-old he's probably out of the woods for that sort of thing but if he was younger like weanlings and things I like to avoid grain as well um awesome. but yeah soy hulls are fabulous fibre sources. yeah, yeah that's yeah. that sounds exciting I get lots of people saying to me you know they put it on oats and they go a bit crazy so mm -hmm. um that's another thing to add yeah. now Joe asks she's also looking for some extra weight over the winter um hers is a thoroughbred and 17 years old and ridden a couple of times. He's on a grain-free um, Macmillan feed, Equijoule and Lucerne yep. Chaff, but she said there's no, she grazes in a group of, of horses somewhere else and unable to feed hay. So just, just wondering whether she should, um, what she should increase, whether it's something like a rapeseed meal or an oil um, or what the story is there, what would you recommend? Yep. Cool. So um, initially, that's a really nice balanced diet, depending on how much she's feeding um, of the grain free and equidual. But if she's feeding the recommended amount, that's fabulous to meet nutrient requirements. Um, the fact that she can't feed hay is a little bit of a problem because obviously they mm. still need that 1.5% of their body weight in forage and hay is one of the best forms to use. Um, horses need to chew, essentially they need to chew to produce bicarbonate in their saliva that counteracts against the gastric acid in their tummies or in their stomach, so that's getting into sort of ulcer um, discussion, which I think we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but that's why they need that sort of long stem fibre because it takes them longer to chew it. Um, so hay would be the best thing. So whether she can try and give him hay when she brings him into ride um, and whenever he's away from the other horses, that would be really good. If that's not feasible, um, then increasing the grain free would be a good idea or adding some chaff to the diet or any other different types of fibre that she could put in that feed bin um, is fabulous. Um, so grain free is, yeah, is, as I said, a fibre source. So increasing that is really good. Um, and then, yeah, adding some chaff or, or other fibre sources is, is a good idea. And the hay also in wintertime keeps them warm, doesn't it? Because it takes yeah, so much longer to digest. So it kind of... Keeps them keeps them warm. That's a, that, that's an issue. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, let's move to um, let's move to ulcers, the dirty old yep. ulcers that cause so many problems with yep. all our horses now nowadays. Yep. Um, so you know, aside from a low grain, constant roughage, and gastric buffers, is there anything else that you can can do to help them reoccurring? Yeah, so ulcers are a really tricky one and quite often um, really tricky to manage and you can think that you've got on top of them and then they'll come back. Um, so absolutely, she's spot on with going with a low grain diet. Um, grain has less of buffering capacity in the stomach than something like forage does, so keeping that low is a good idea. It also produces volatile fatty acids, which contribute to the acid production and um, can contribute to those ulcers too. So again, going with low grain, high fat and fiber um, in the diet is a good idea. Um, the tricky thing about ulcers is that there's not just one type. Um, so this, if you think about the stomach, it's sort of roughly in an average sort of 500 kilo horse, it's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit smaller than say like a rugby ball, so it's not that big. And it's Gosh, divided- it's tiny up, for the size of them. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, quite, it's not that big. Um, it's divided into two parts. So at the bottom, you've got the squamous area, which is where the gastric acid is produced. Sorry, it's not the top is the squamous area. Let's take that back. The bottom is called the glandular area. The top is called the squamous area. So at the bottom, it's protected by glands, and that's where the acid gets produced. At the top is the squamous, and that's not protected by glands. So that's most of the time is where the ulcers um, occur because the acid splashes onto that top part, onto that squamous region, and causes the problem. Sometimes, though, they can get glandular ulcers, so at the bottom of the stomach, due to a breakdown in the mucus there, um, and so they're generally harder to treat. Another type of ulcer that they can get is in this pyloric region, and the pylorus is the tube that goes into the small intestine, which goes around the corner from the glandular region, so they're really hard to get to to treat them. So the first thing I recommend doing is talking to your vet about this because they'll have recommendations as well. But generally, if your horse is diagnosed with ulcers, you need to put them onto a course of omeprazole, which is the active drug acts like a proton um, pump inhibitor to stop the production of gastric acid and help those ulcers to heal. Sometimes if you've got really, really tricky ulcers that maybe are in that glandular region or in the pyloric region, you might need to use omeprazole and sucralfate. Sucralfate is basically something that adheres to that ulcer and acts like a band-aid to protect it and help it to heal as well. Um, so that's what I would recommend, again, with veterinary advice, to knock them on the head. Then going forward, there is a huge amount of supplements on the market, um, digestive aids and things like that. There's only really a couple that I would recommend, but one of them is called Maxia Complete. It's fabulous. It's a marine-derived calcium. So calcium's got really, really high buffering qualities against that gastric acid. Um, so when you're coming to the end of your course of omeprazole, I'd recommend putting them onto um, Maxia Complete, 40 grams a day for seven days, and then down to 20 grams. Um, and that will essentially, hopefully, keep the ulcers at bay without having to keep them on long-term use of omeprazole or sucralphage. Um, as well as using supplements like Maxia, lots of forage. Lucerne is a fabulous buffer against gastric acid because it's higher in calcium. One really good tip is to never work them on an empty stomach. So giving them a handful or two of Lucerne, or at least sort of two litres, say an ice cream container of Lucerne, so that they're not working on an empty stomach. So the Lucerne essentially acts like a mat and sits on the top of that gastric acid and stops it from splashing onto the top part of the, the stomach and causing those problems. Um, so yeah, there's lots of little tips and tricks, um, but the biggest thing is, as she's mentioned, lots and lots of forage, low grain, um, and potentially treating them if you think your horse is really, really at risk and using something like Maxia Complete to keep them at bay long term. Brilliant. Hope that helps. Uh, definitely, especially as Christina, I know the one who asked about the ulcers, her horse keeps um, getting them back again. So that's really good to know about yeah. the the other type of ulcer that's in that little. Yeah, and the glandular region. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. He could have pyloric ulcers. So I'd probably recommend getting some veterinary advice and finding a vet that's, that is more experienced in, that, in digestive conditions and in ulcers. And there's a few of them around, depending on where she's based. But they will be able to scope because it's actually quite hard to scope the pylorus because it's kind of around this little bend and around the corner. Um, so, yeah, the vet would need to actually diagnose that properly. And then once 
the vet knows and they get a diagnosis of where the ulcers are, they'll know how to treat them and exactly what drugs to use and, and for how long and things. But yeah, in terms of nutritional long-term management, lucerne's fabulous and a high fat and fiber diet, low grain. Um, stressy types quite often can be worse with ulcers because they're not good eaters and they'll generally sort of not have their head down and graze in the paddock and they'll just sort of walk around like if you've got fence walkers and things. So a lot of it can be behavioural related too. So it's about, yeah, calming them down. Um, so there's a few things that, that come into it. Um, now, just uh, Rebecca's just asked a question um, because I was talking to her about the Maxima Complete because I've had amazing results on that as well. She said that um, their latest one that they've got out, the Digest, um, yeah. Yeah. have... Um, What's the difference between the Maxima Complete and the Maxima Complete Digest? Is it just so they've Maxima, got a... Maxia Digest has got a specific strain of yeast in it as well. So not only does the foregut, but it can help with the bacteria and the hindgut as well. So it does your complete digestive health. It's fabulous too. And there's been some really good results from that one as well. Yep. Brilliant. Now, yep. something that um, that I, I want to ask is that yep. um, I've been told before that a lot of the products that are used for their gut have got yeast in them and that the quality of yeast really varies and that's why you get such a variation between what works and what doesn't. Is that right or is that an old yep. wives' tale? Yep. Yeah, no, yeah. that's absolutely true. There's lots of different strains of yeast out there. The yeast is basically known as a prebiotic because it's food for the bacteria in, in the hindgut. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, I could be here all night about the different strains, but um, there's there's some that are really, really good and really beneficial, and the one that's in Maxia Digest is great. And then there's some that others that aren't so sort of credible and don't don't work as well. But um, yeah, there's some, there's various different types of yeast, and there's some that are in feeds that are really good too. So it essentially works to feed the bacteria. So yeah, it's, brilliant. It's um, now, so let me see on my list. It's not jumping out at me. Um, Ali asked about her horse on its way to hunts. Um, oh, there we go. Now, she wanted to know what's the best thing. You probably answered this a little bit. So when she goes hunting, um, giving, uh, giving the horse hay on the way, do you think that that's right. okay, feeding the hay on the way there? Because when the horse gets there, it really won't eat, um, and it has had a history of ulcers before. Depends how long the float ride is, do you know? Yeah, so they she lives in the middle of the sticks, so I know I know it'll be a long float ride. So okay. yeah, two um, to four hours. Do you okay. know? No, possibly yeah. actually. That was how long the hunters know, but she does she does live somewhere where she'd have to drive okay. pretty much. Yeah, um, decent away. Really good question. And there's obviously pros and cons to providing hay in the float. Um Basically, I mean, at the end of the day, when we have just talked about this with ulcers, but um, essentially the reason that horses get at risk of ulcers is because they produce gastric acid 24-7. So with humans, we sort of have a meal and our stomach goes, okay, there's food coming, I'm going to get ready to digest it and produce gastric acid. Horses produce it all the time, which is why they need to eat relatively constantly and chew to produce bicarbonate in their saliva. So the bicarbonate buffers the gastric acid and so does the forage, obviously. So the hay or the lucerne or whatever you're feeding. So leaving them without forage for four hours or more can put them at risk of ulcers. If you do it once or twice, it's possibly not the end of the world, but if you did it on a regular basis, it would definitely cause the problem. So it's pretty much about using a better judgment because obviously with having hay in the float, if it's for a long time, you do have a bit of a risk of choke because they don't have access to water. So if you've got um, the ability to stop regularly for water breaks or take them off for a break, then hay is probably fine. And obviously if you can see them, hay is probably fine too. Um, if you've got a camera or you can see them through the window of your float, that's fine. So it's it's a bit of a personal one. Um, it's a bit of a, you know, whether if your horse has choked previously, probably wouldn't give them hay in the float. But if you think they're fine and you can keep an eye on them, then it's probably fine. But again, if it's just once or twice for a couple of hours, it's actually not going to be too at risk of ulcers. But if they're getting up to that sort of three or four hours of travel, you are potentially running a bit of a fine line. Um, so, yeah, stopping regularly for picks of grass and then giving it grass and hay as soon as you get there is fabulous, obviously, And if you don't want to give them hay in the float. 
Yes, because, you know, it is one of those things that um, I have heard of a couple of horses choke, and yeah. which makes you really nervous. But I suppose it, it's pretty easy as well to stop on the side of the road and have a big handful of um, lucerne chaff, which has got your calcium yeah. on it, and just let them scoff a big, you know, a couple of mouthfuls. Yes, and, yeah. you know, yeah. put so something in there. Just do that. Just, yeah, stop regularly for picks of grass or handfuls of lucerne in happy days. Cool. So, can we talk about a little bit about. Um, supplements do you know what supplements is just a nightmare people send their horses for schooling and i'm like oh my god it's like a recipe is one teaspoon of that four of this tablespoon oh, yeah. of that so let's have a let's have a little talk about what's your thoughts on that you know do you think that every horse needs a vitamin supplement um whether you should test the pasture first or whether you should test the horse do you just go for yeah. gold and tell us what you think yeah, so if you're talking about basic sort of all around vitamin and mineral supplements, um, I think there's some really, really good ones on the market, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important if you're going to choose one, to choose one that's been formulated for New Zealand conditions. Um, there's lots of overseas ones and Australian ones that come over and they can be okay, but our pastures and our soils are very different to Australia, obviously. Um, so a New Zealand fortified one or a New Zealand formulated one is a really good idea. Um, it's up to you whether you choose a uh, vitamin and mineral supplement like a powder or a pellet or go with a fully formulated feed at the right levels. So if you, go, if you want to go with raw ingredients and just make up your own diet, like using um, what we were talking about before with the canola meal or grains or beet or things like that, and you don't want to use a premixed feed, that's absolutely fine. Then you will need to feed a vitamin and mineral supplement because most of those raw ingredients don't have adequate trace minerals and vitamins. However, if you want to choose a commercial feed or a premix feed, um, choose one, get some help, choose one that's right for your horse, feed it at the right levels, um, and then they'll be meeting all of their trace mineral and vitamin requirements, um, and you won't need to add another powder supplement or a pellet. Um, in terms of the formulations, as I said, choosing one that's right for New Zealand um, conditions is really good. You can get your pastures tested if you want to, and we actually have that service. We have um, through our relationship with Kentucky Equine Research, we have access to diet analysis software called Microsteed. So if someone wants to get really specific, they can test their pasture and we can put the pasture into Microsteed and then design a diet based off that. So balance their diet based on what their pasture is providing the horse. Um, you can do that, but it's really getting into the nitty gritty and sort of micromanaging because obviously pasture does vary a lot during the year. So you could do it once or you could really get into it and do it sort of every season and build up a bit of a profile of your pasture. Um, we've got a database with microstate of pastures from all around New Zealand for different times of the year. So you could also just use a nutritionist or use me and use microstate to design a diet based on the pasture database that we've already got. Um, as an example, I mean, again, Going with New Zealand formulations, Equine Balancer, NRM Equine Balancer is the first one that springs to mind for a really lovely balanced vitamin and mineral supplement. If you don't want to feed um, a full premix feed, again, if you want to go with those raw ingredients and then top up your vitamins and minerals that way, it's really, that is one of the better ones that you can get. And it's got natural vitamin E and a few different bowels and there too. So, yeah. And I suppose if you, if, you, if you did a price analysis on that, you would probably work out to be cheaper buying a feed that's actually made for New Zealand horses without putting all the additives in. Yeah. You would, yeah. I would, I would yeah. guess. Another thing about the pasture, testing your pasture, is that um, in Pukekohe I had a terrible issue with grass effectiveness and I actually, because yeah. of that, I tested the pasture and yeah. found that it was really high in potassium which is what was making all the horses super, super sensitive. So that would be something else. If you've got issues with several of the horses on one property, that might be a, an option to actually have a look and see whether there's something in the property that's that's causing yep. that as well. Yeah, definitely. A lot, a lot of pastures can be high in potassium, definitely. Um, forage yeah. in itself is generally quite high in potassium, particularly low So, yeah, if you're wanting to find out and get really specific with your property, um, you can absolutely do that and something might sort of jump out of you. Selenium's another one. We've always thought the New Zealand um, pastures are low in selenium, but we're sort of finding with a bit of testing lately that it's not necessarily the case. Um, so that is one nutrient that I definitely sort of, yeah, look to test for in your horses and your pasture if you're at all concerned. Um, yeah. 
Now, um, what about um, salt as well? Have uh, have a little talk about salt. Um, whether you whether you recommend um, adding that into horses feeds because I yep. you know lots of people who need to feed it well have been told to feed it because it helps um, neutralize toxins and and that sort of thing in the horse's diet. Yeah, so where you recommend adding salt to a horse's feed um, because we do put some salt into our feeds, for example. So if we're designing a diet based on our feeds, we do put a little bit of salt in there to meet recommendations, but we recommend more because we can't formulate a feed based on sweat loss. So salt is essentially sodium and chloride. Horses lose sodium and chloride in their sweat, um, so they need to put it back with salt and a balanced electrolyte. Um, in terms of neutralising toxins, there's not a lot of research behind that. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly have never recommended salt or excessive amounts of salt to neutralise toxins in a horse's diet. No, okay. it's more right. as an electrolyte to replace those minerals that are lost in sweat. Okay, well that's that's good. Um, now, what about unpasteurised cider vinegar, garlic, and um, bicarb soda? Those magnesium, all those sorts of extra yep. additives that that we've been told to feed. Yeah, so apple cider vinegar is good for taste. If you want to help your horse drink water, maybe if it's away from home and it's not drinking the water, you can put a little bit in there because they do quite like the taste of it, obviously, with apple. Um, other than that, I wouldn't really recommend feeding it because it is an acid. It's an acetic acid vinegar, so mm. you're essentially putting more acid into their stomachs. No, I don't want so, that. No, that's no from me. Um, what was the yeah. other one? Garlic. Garlic. So that's an interesting one, actually, because um, I think we've all probably fed garlic um, once in a while. I know I used to feed it to my pony back in the day, um, and we we're always told that it's really helpful for immunity and lots of different things. Um, not to scare people, but there has been some research that shows that it's linked to a condition called Heinz body anemia. So essentially, it was through feeding quite a lot of garlic a day, but essentially what happens is that the red blood cells develop these little cysts on them called Heinz body, and then Heinz bodies, and then the spleen eliminates them because it sees them as irregular, which essentially makes the horse anemic. So I'm not sort of saying that you know you should stop all your garlic and you know um, panic. But I wouldn't be feeding something that's got research like that behind it. And the other thing about garlic is that there's no research in horses that shows that it helps with immunity in any sort of those reasons that we feed it for. Um, I think there is a little bit of a danger with um, things that are beneficial for people because garlic is beneficial for us and using them with, with horses. You know how garlic, people say never to feed it to dogs and things like spring onions, things like that. It's sort of okay. the same for horses. Same, so same it's a little, little bit wary about that. Yeah. Um, um, Bicarb soda. Bicarb. So bicarb is a neutralising agent. Um, so it can help to neutralise the gastric acid a little bit, but the thing with bicarb is that it doesn't stay in the stomach for very long. Um, so it doesn't have that much of an effect on the gastric acid a little bit, but you'd have to feed quite a lot of it. What it does do is that it goes quite quickly into the bloodstream. Um, so essentially what it does in there is that it buffers the lactic acid and stops the horse from getting tired. So that's actually called milkshaking. I was just going to say, good. isn't that what they're all banned from doing with trotters? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So that's what naughty racehorse trainers do. And it's highly, highly illegal. They feed a lot of it. Like they, they give a, a, a huge amount at one time. Um, yeah, definitely wouldn't recommend doing that. Small amounts in the feed is really common. A lot of people do that, again, to help neutralise the, the stomach acid. I wouldn't recommend it because it doesn't have a huge effect. One thing that does help, though, is feeding bicarb that's been encapsulated. So there's a really, really um, effective supplement from Kentucky Equine Research called Equishore, which yeah, is brilliant. essentially encapsulated sodium bicarb. So what that does is that it bypasses, or it goes through the stomach, but it doesn't activate until it gets to the hindgut. When it's in the hindgut, it activates and helps to balance the hindgut microbes, restore the pH, and stop it from getting too acidic back there. So it doesn't, bicarb doesn't do much in the stomach, um, regardless of how you feed it. If you feed it encapsulated, it travels all the way through 25 metres of small intestine in the stomach till it gets to the hindgut, activates, and it helps to buffer those microbes. So that is probably the only way that I'd recommend feeding sodium bicarb is through Equishore. Yeah. Yeah. What about magnesium? And um, I suppose dolomite is a, is a form of magnesium. Yeah. So what do you, what's your thoughts on magnesium? 
Yep, so magnesium is probably one of the biggest supplement, supplements that people provide their horses um, on its own, or magnesium in the form of magnesium oxide or magnesium sulfate. Um, it's an interesting one, actually, because it's definitely got links to nervous behaviour. So if a horse is deficient in magnesium, they may show some nervous signs um, and it can have an effect on them. However, it's actually really easy to meet a horse's magnesium requirements just through forage and a balanced feed or yeah, just providing them with, with a balanced diet. Um, so it's really, I actually think I'd really struggle to find a horse in New Zealand that's magnesium deficient. I could be proved wrong with that, but it's, yeah, it's really hard for them for them to be deficient. There's not a lot of research that shows that feeding more magnesium, so beyond their requirements, has any effect on their behaviour. Um, again, I mean, I can give you guys all the information, but if you're feeding magnesium to your horse and you think that it's working and that it's having a really good effect on their behaviour, happy days. Keep feeding it because it's it's a safe supplement. At the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not going to make them too overfortified, and they generally just excrete what they don't use. So, yes, the science says. If you give magnesium over requirements, it's not going to do anything for their behaviour. But if you're finding something different, then that's absolutely fine. So, because it does definitely have a link with, with nerves. Yeah, which leads me on to a question um, about uh, different different um, seasons and whether you change your toxin binder and your magnesium and all those sorts of things depending on the seasons. Shall we talk about grass effectiveness then? Because it's kind of leading yes. to that. <laughs> yep, let's rip into yeah. that. That, that yes, yeah, that's a massive. About grass yeah, yeah, excuse me, my voice is going a little bit. Um, okay, so with grass effectiveness, again, this is a really, really interesting topic. Um, I sort of, whenever I'm talking about um, grass effectiveness, so even if I'm sort of in the store or doing a talk or, or talking to someone one on one. Um, I sort of like to start out by explaining that, I mean, everyone knows what Google Scholar is, right? It's obviously that website that you go in to find peer-reviewed articles and research back papers on any sort of condition or subject. If you put equine gastric ulcer syndrome or equine hunger acidosis or even equine grass daggers or something like that into Google Scholar, you'll get a plethora of articles there which are all really, really helpful and peer-reviewed and scientifically backed. If you put grass effectiveness in there, you don't get anything. So it's actually not a scientific term. It's one that's just been invented by people um, to explain how grass affects horses. And that's absolutely fine because there are two different things in grasses that definitely have an effect on horses. So just because it's not a scientific term doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it is just interesting um, that, yeah, it's not actually a specific condition. So in terms of what's in the grass that can have an effect on your horse's behaviour, there's two different things. One is toxins, um, specific toxins that are found in rye grass. It's called Lolotrine B, um, and it's produced by an endophyte at the base of the leaf. Um, so that specifically causes a condition called ryegrass staggers. If you've ever seen a horse with, with really severe ryegrass staggers, you'll never forget it. It's really awful. It affects their nervous system, and essentially they get staggery and they can't walk. They definitely can't sort of back up, and that's one of the ways to, to see whether they've got it. Mild symptoms of it is to try and get them to back up, but if they've got it really severely, um, it's pretty, pretty obvious that they've got it. They need to be taken off the pasture for two reasons, obviously for them to stop ingesting those toxins and for their own safety because they can go through fences and um, have accidents if they're not sort of confined. So put into a box is the best thing for them. Um, in terms of toxin binders, um, if the horse has got full-blown sort of grass daggers like that, it's too late for a toxin binder. You need to just get them off the grass and help them to recover. Um, the thing with, if a horse has got mild staggers, so maybe just a few symptoms and maybe a little bit sort of spooky and looky, a toxin binder could be effective. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and the research behind toxin binders and the, the reason that I don't recommend them a lot is that the research says that they need to be fed at the same time as the toxin, so they're actually not that long lasting. So unless you're sprinkling it on your pasture or going out and giving it to your horse regularly, they're not really going to be that effective. Um, 
In terms of if you do want to try a toxin binder, um, the one that I would recommend is the Nutritech EcoGuard or EcoGuard Plus. Those ones are pretty much the, the, the more credible ones. I mean, Nutritech is a really credible company and they've done a lot of research. So if you do want to use a toxin binder, go with that one. However, it's not a Band-Aid. At the end of the day, no amount of a toxin binder um, is going to help hugely when the horse is still ingesting a lot of those toxins. So if it's grazing ryegrass, the best thing to do is, is get it off the ryegrass, particularly in summer and autumn, um, which are the high risk um, seasons for, for that endophyte. Um, so that's staggers. The other thing that can affect horses that is in the pasture is sugars. So in pasture, there's a specific type of sugar called fructans. They're a storage sugar. Um, all sugars or all easily digestible carbohydrates need to be digested in the horse's small intestine and stomach. With fructans, they're actually unable to digest them there. So the fructans automatically go into the hindgut and they cause that problem that I was talking about before with, with using Equishaw to treat it called hindgut acidosis. So that hindgut acidosis leads to loose manure. I mean, we've all seen what happens when you put your horse out to a fresh paddock of grass. That is a hindgut imbalance when they get loose manure. Hyperactive behaviour, um, even really mild colic um, symptoms, and it can lead to laminitis. Um, that's one of the other ways that horses can get laminitis is through those fructans in, in the um, pasture. So on one hand, you've got sugars. On the other hand, you've got toxins. Those are the two things that can cause issues, behavioural issues with, with horses. Sugars generally cause hyperactive behaviour, like a kid with a bag of lollies, going to buck you off, that sort of thing. Toxins generally cause staggery behaviour. There is a grey area in the middle where they could be spooky, looking at things, reactive, where it could actually be either. So that's where you sort of have to decide whether you go with Equishore or a toxin binder or both. Probably try one at a time to see what's going to work. Um, but again, there are no band-aids for getting the horse off the pasture, which is the root cause of the problem. And that's, yeah, com continu they're continuing to ingest that whether it's the sugars or the toxins that are causing that problem. So that needs to be taken away first. So probably if your horse is really bad, whether it, whatever sort of grass affected it's got, I would take it off the pasture first and then start introducing it slowly with either Equishaw or a toxin binder and go from there. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, well, in the real world, doesn't it? It'd be nice if we could just feed them, uh, feed them something, and have it work. But the fact that it needs to be ingested at the same time, well, that's that's not very um, easy to do, is it? Damn yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, um, now, uh, da, 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 I've got a whole. Um, okay, Briar wants to know what is the best thing to gain um, muscle and top line. Um yeah, are you or and are you better to feed a purpose made hard feed um or feed a simple feed with added additives? Yep. So you'd want to look at the whole diet obviously for um top line and muscle conditioning, but feeding lots of fiber, obviously we talked about fiber quite a lot this evening. Um and also uh, giving definitely a fat supplement. Uh, meeting protein requirements is obviously really important too because protein is basically the building blocks of muscle. Um, so using probably a complete feed to do that because they've got all the added minerals and vitamins in there as well. And then using something like a fat supplement is a really, really good idea. So one that we recommend a lot of is called Kentucky Equine Research Equijol. That is a really, really amazing conditioning supplement. It's been around for donkey's years. Mm. Um, it's essentially a stabilised rice bran. So it's one of those feeds that's classified as a supplement because you add it in with your complete feed. Um, and some horses only need a cup or two. You can feed up to two kilos, depending on how much weight gain you're after. But some of them can maintain condition um, on sort of a cup or two. Um, and it's essentially a high fat, low starch conditioning supplement. There's other conditioning supplements out there that aren't necessarily very low in starch. Um, so it's it's nicer um, to give that sort of slow release energy and put condition on that way with, with a high, 
high fat supplement. In terms of whether you go for a complete feed or um, different ingredients, it's totally personal preference up to you. You can use um, different raw materials and add a vitamin and mineral supplement if you wanted to and then, then add Equijol as well. Um, so you'd feed things like beet pop, soy hulls, um, your canola meal, linseed, things like that, or you could add some grains in. Um, and then adding something like a fat supplement, um, like oil or equal as well, would be yeah, would be really handy. So there's there's lots of different ways to attack a diet like that, um, and it's pretty much personal preference whether you want to go with a commercial feed or your own ingredients. Um, commercial feeds, I mean, as a nutritionist, we take the guesswork out of it and we formulate it. We formulate the feed specifically for your horse to give them what they need if the feed's fed, if you choose the right feed and if you feed it at the right level. So that is one of the easier ways to do it, and there's lots of places to get advice for that sort of thing um i'm gonna yeah give kirsten my details at the end of this as well so anyone can get in touch if they want to yeah i'm um, just going elaborating a little bit um jess has asked about um oils now this is a really good question because yep. we are always in that dilemma of whether you go to pack and save and buy a big two liter or you know 10 liter bottle of of canola oil um so do you yep. want to talk about the the pros and cons of the yep. omega-6 and 9 you know inflammatory and inflammatory yep absolutely so oils are obviously fabulous conditioning supplements they're a very concentrated form of energy um, but you do have to choose one that's got the best ratio or array of omega essential essential fatty acids. So essential fatty acids, there's omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-9s are non-essential because the horse manufactures them themselves. Um, omega-3s are non-inflammatory. Omega-6s aren't necessarily pro-inflammatory. They're just le not as... So omega-3s are less inflammatory, sorry, than omega-6s. So omega-6s aren't necessarily pro-inflammatory. Um, and it's best to just get that ratio right. So and it's really important to look at the, the whole diet as well as just the oil. So basically, grains are high in omega-6s and forages are high in omega-3s. So if you're feeding a high grain diet, it's probably better to go with a high, uh, an oil that's higher in omega-3s. If you're feeding a high forage diet, you're probably getting enough omega-3s. So you could pretty much go with, with whichever oil. So the best oils for your omega-3 to 6 ratio are linseed, definitely. Linseed's fabulous. It's got a really good ratio of omega-3 to 6. Canola's not too bad. One of the worst ones is rice bran. Um, rice bran oil and corn oil are not so good because, again, that corn oil, corn oil is, is coming from a grain which is high in omega-6s. So it's about getting that ratio right. But at the end of the day, omega-3s and 6s are both essential fatty acids. So even though omega-6s are more inflammatory than omega-3s, some form of inflammation is actually really is actually needed, particularly for healing. So they're not necessarily the bad guy. It's just about getting that ratio right and making sure that you don't skew it too much. So if you're worried about it, definitely choosing a linseed oil. Um, the other oil that's really handy is a fish oil. So Kentucky Equine Research have one called EO3. That's amazing because it provides those omega-3 fatty acids in the long chain form. So it's called DHA and EPA. Um, which has already been um, elongated, basically. So the horse needs to elongate the fatty acids to DHA and EPA before they can utilise them, so it's already in that form for them to use. So, yeah, at the end of the day, if you are concerned about that ratio, um, go with linseed or a fish oil. Okay. Um, now, one, uh, one of my students here has asked about kakuya. Um, yep. So the effects of kikuya, um on the calcium intake. Yep. So um, how do you know when you should um, supplement them, and is that is that something you need to do with a blood test, or or what's the story there with the with the kikuya? Yeah. So kikuya is a pasture that's generally found in Northland, um, and it's a pasture, a tropical pasture that's quite high in oxalates. Um, and oxalates are these little compounds that bind to calcium and stop it from being absorbed. Um, so it can make the horse calcium deficient. So I would probably recommend a diet analysis. You can do a blood test, but it's a little bit tricky with blood tests because they only give you um, the circulating amount of um, minerals that are in the blood at that time, unless you want to do consecutive blood tests and build up a bit of a picture. Um, but it's really hard to test for the sort of stored minerals. 
So um, I'd recommend doing a diet analysis and we can do that with microsteed. You essentially pick a pasture that's super, super low in calcium and you make sure that the horse is getting more than their requirements for calcium. The other important thing with grazing on a high oxalate pasture like Kokuya is making sure the calcium to phosphorus ratio is right. So that needs to be at least two to one, two parts calcium to one parts phosphorus. So we would make sure that that was achieved in the diet too. Um, so feeding calcium sources alongside, if you can't remove the horse from the high oxalate pasture, giving lots of calcium sources like lucerne and high calcium feeds is a really good idea. And you might need to add in some limestone um, with that as well, which is a really good calcium source. So that's, cool. yeah, I'd recommend a diet, uh, diet analysis for that. How are you going, Lou? Are you, are you getting are you getting part there? Are you okay for a few well, more questions? Excellent. Good girl. So um, this is a good question because um, Joe's asked. You know, you hear this thing. You know, oh, you shouldn't feed a mare this and bloody blah, blah. So do you feed according to gender? Is that a thing? Yep. Good question. Um, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, you're always going to get differences between mares and geldings, and there are some hormonal issues that come into mares that you probably need to consider. Um, there's not a lot of research behind how sort of nutrition affects hormones hugely. Um, I, I mean, you can always generalise and sort of say, you know, our mares can be hot, our geldings can be more laid back, but that's quite a big generalisation. I mean, I think we all probably know a hot gelding or a laid back mare as well. So I would generally, um, pick a feed or feed according to the type of horse that you've got in front of you and what their behaviour is like. Um, so, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, I'd say not necessarily. You don't necessarily have to feed for gender, just feed for the type of horse that you've got. It's the same with breed. You know, most of the time people go, you know, thoroughbreds, this is a gross generalisation, thoroughbreds are really hot and excitable and warm bloods can be sort of quieter and lazier. Um, but again, we all know hot warm bloods or quiet lazy thoroughbreds as well. So it's important to just look at the horse that you've got in front of you. Cool. Um, which Rebecca did say, um, can that mess up their hormones? So that's answered that question as well, which is good. Now, um, what can you feed if you've got a horse that gets a bit hot um, over winter time? Um, what's the most affordable hard feed for maintaining weight without them getting silly? So a horse that gets hot yeah. and needs weight gain over winter without getting silly. So yeah. fibre sources. So go yeah. with um, beet pulp, soy hulls, grain free is a good one. Anything that's really, really high in fibre. And then fat sources. So pick an oil. So your linseed oil or canola oil is okay. Again, it's got an okay omega-3 to 6 ratio. Um, we have a fabulous feed called Muscle Relief, which has got high fat and fibre, low starch. So basically, if your horse gets hot or gets hyperactive, you want to give them energy through fat and fibre rather than grain, because the grain um, can get grain basically gets digested really quickly and releases into the bloodstream in the form of glucose so that can cause hyperactive behavior so if you've got a hot horse you want to decrease the grain but you still need to meet their calorie requirements obviously because if you just take the grain out they'll lose weight so meeting their calorie requirements with um, super fibers beet pop soy hulls and um, fat sources like equidrol and oils are a good idea and lots and lots of hay lucerne is fabulous it's generally higher in calories um, so yeah, there's a few different ways that you can you could go about that. Again, if you're, if you're on a budget, I mean, grain free is actually a really good feed if you're on a budget because it's, it's relatively cost effective for what it is, and it's got all your nutrients in there as well. So yeah. nice. Last question: any any thoughts on um, joint supplements? Is that <laughs> is that something you've you've delved into? A little bit, yeah. I mean, there is, again, so many on the market and there's so many different ingredients that um, people sort of make claims that can be really effective. Um, depending on if you've got a horse that you want to prevent joint problems or one that is a bit older and maybe already showing signs of arthritic changes that you're wanting to sort of manage, um, if it's about prevention, I think you can't go past glucosamine hydrochloride. That is a really, really digestible, absorbable type of glucosamine. It's fabulous for joints. Um, if you're looking to treat or to manage arthritic changes already, glucosamine is still good. Um, and the other ingredient is hyaluronic acid. So again, Kentucky Equine Research have got a great um, joint supplement called Cinevate HA. It's in a liquid um, and that basically makes the joint fluid more viscous. 
Um, so it helps the joints to move over themselves better. It gives it more um, lubrication um, and that can really help um, as well. So those are the two ingredients that I find are the best for joints is your glucosamine, hydrochloride and hyaluronic acid. Fantastic. Well, I would just like to say thank you so much, Lou, for um, tuning in and answering all these questions. And I'm sorry, guys, there's loads of questions there, but I think that um, Lou will be getting quite parched now and it's been an awesome Rose. evening. So thank you so much. I will and, um, send you my details. So if anyone has any questions, just flip me an email or give me a ring or a text or something. I'm happy to help with one-on-one -on -one, um, individual diets for horses and we can do custom-made diets with micro or whatever you want or we can just have a chat about your horse's diet and fine, so that's fine. Excellent. So, well, this has been such a success that I think we'll do another one in a, in a couple of weeks if you're keen, Lou. Yeah, sounds good. So you can put, me on, put me on the spot and ask me in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> yeah, pressure's on. No, all good. Yeah. Yeah, again it was good it's always fun it's the Excellent. first live one I've done but yeah I'd definitely be keen to do more so it sounds awesome. good awesome and thanks, thanks everybody for joining in it's really good to see you all and um stay safe and see you soon thanks guys, thanks, guys. see you bye, bye.